All right, we'll give it just a minute to get everyone in. All right. Well, while everyone is logging in, just a few announcements for you guys. All of the phone lines have been muted, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box located on your menu bar, or you can use the chat feature. Any question relating to the presentation, we'll just hang on to the end, and our presenters will answer those. Oops. And just a reminder that this webinar is not worth CPE credit, but we will record it and we will post it to our I'd Bailey YouTube page so you can view it later. All right, let's do some introductions. Go ahead, Art. Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is Art Wiederman. Uh, I'm a dental specific CPA. And the last time I visited with you, I was a partner at the CPA firm of HMWC, CPAs and Business Advisors. And as of Monday, I am now a director in the dental division of a wonderful CPA firm called Ide Bailey. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, we're gonna talk today about um, some of the things going on uh, primarily with the uh, Health and Human Services Provider Relief Fund, the stimulus bills, a little bit of PPP news, and then we're gonna spend the last hour of our webinar. Um, you're gonna be hearing uh, Jamie Marbo of a wonderful company called Inspired Hygiene uh, is going to talk to you about how to make your hygiene department better and more productive. Uh, so we're going to do that. So let me introduce everybody. It's uh, you, You've met me. Uh, Scott Haberman. Scott is a CPA. Uh, uh, he's an MPACC, MST, <laughs> HBO, ESPN, <laughs> YouTube, whatever else he is. He's a partner at uh, I Bailey. Hey, Scott, how you doing? I'm good, Art. How about yourself? I'm good. Someday you'll tell me what all those letters mean because I do <laughs> numbers, I don't do letters. Um, Scott is my partner in crime. Scott is a, uh, a, a partner in um, Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, in the Fort Collins, Colorado office of I Bailey and is uh, working with um, uh, lots of dentists. And he and I are, you know, we're working closely together. And I'm really excited about our new relationship. Uh, we're solving I have my, the world's uh, problems together is what we're doing. And we're solving, yeah, we're saving the world. That's what we're doing. Uh, my new bestest friend, uh, Miss Megan Mortimer, who is a congressional lobbyist from the American Dental Association. Hey, Megan. Hi, hi, guys. You know, Scott, when you're not on, I'm the partner in crime, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, Megan, Megan has been, uh, Megan and the ADA have been unbelievable in their, everything that they've been doing behind the scenes to try and help dentists with all this legislation, which we're going to talk about. And uh, hi, Jamie. Jamie Marbo is, uh, you, got lot, God, you guys have lots more letters behind your name than I do. I'm kind of, I feel like insufficient here. Uh, Jamie is with Inspired Hygiene. And how you doing, Jamie? Jamie, can you hear us? Are you on I'm sorry, mute? I was muted and I had a couple screens open. Hi, I'm, it's nice to meet all you guys. I'm really excited to be here with you guys. All right, so this is the four of us today. So we're going to spend the first 30 minutes on some stuff and we'll get to Jamie. We'll have a good hour of really great information on hygiene and hygiene departments and what you should be doing. Uh, the, I've always been of the opinion that the hygiene department is the life's blood of your dental practice. So um, I am now uh, a member, go, go back one. I am now a director in the dental division with Ide Bailey. Um, I'm going to let Scott tell you about the firm. Scott, you've been with the firm how long? I've been with the firm for, this is my fourth year uh, with the firm, uh, a number of years prior to that with uh, other practice in Seattle, Washington area. Uh, but it's, it's been a great, great four year run for me. I think you're going to enjoy all of the, uh, the folks you're going to start to work with and all the other services that we can really provide to our clients to solve some of their problems and, and provide some more solutions for them to help take their uh, businesses to the next level. And for our clients, uh, our HMWC clients who are either listening live or will listen to this um, on, uh, on demand, if you will, um, I now have, as do my partners, Don Watson, Pam Chamberlain, and our tax manager, Sam Williams, and our dental team in Tustin, California, 
Uh, I now have resources that I couldn't have dreamed of having. Uh, basically, I mean, the top thing, one of the top things we've got is we are in the process right now, Scott, um, of, of working with uh, your research and development tax credit group to put a specific program together for our dental clients. And, um, you know, they, we have some real opportunities, hopefully for not all, but some of our dentists who uh, get more involved in, uh, you know, R&D type things that qualify. Uh, we're probably going to have them on one of these webinars coming up. Oh, they'll definitely be on my podcast. Uh, we do cost segregation studies. And um, for any of you that, if you, you know, maybe if you're a new client to, to I Bailey or to HMWC, um, take a look and see if we can get you some more tax deductions. They have a whole group that does that. Cybersecurity. I mean, that's scary, isn't it, Scott? Just cybersecurity issues. Yeah, if there's if there's issues with information leaks or any kind of hacks into your system, I mean, this it's a great group. They can help jump in and get in front of it and help you resolve and and even uh, kind of get in front of the press too if that ever became an issue. So a really wonderful group to to have as a resource for us. And then internal controls, uh, fraud prevention, they've got a whole group that does that too. So, you know, one out of every, I think the statistics, I don't know if, if ADA has statistics, but uh, my statistics are that any between one, one in four or one in five, uh, and one in five dentists are, uh, will be embezzled during their careers, sadly to say. And we have, um, uh, we have people that do that too, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, someone that you should meet, his name is Doug Cash. He's out here in Denver, Colorado. Uh, he's talked to a number of my clients before and, and has helped uh, get to the bottom of things with some of the practices and, and also some of those preventative uh, procedures that, that I think a lot of smaller businesses, not just dental, it's not uh, siloed to that industry, but a lot of smaller businesses out there, you, the less folks you have touching the money, the higher exposure you have to potentially losing that money to fraud and an embezzlement like Art was talking about. So uh, they can really help set up your internal controls uh, in a really airtight uh, procedure and provide some really great recommendations to protect yourself and your practice. And then we also have a C C uh, CEO, CFO, bill paying type of a service, Scott. So talk a little bit about that. That would be something that we now have access to as of Monday. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's 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 a solution uh, for really to be your back office um, for your practice of helping you with with bill pay, automating that, streamlining that, taking all of the uh, hours away that, that you're really spending with the paperwork. And we try to streamline that and and be really your back office accounting team. And that includes your accounts payable and and helping with receivables as well. Um, so it's it's something that I think you'll enjoy talking to our folks in our boss group. Um, another acronym for you there, Art, uh, to, to explore that and help provide some more value to clients. My head's gonna explode. <laughs> I, need, I need like a big spreadsheet on my window here, so. Okay, so, so again, I wanna say that I'm very, very excited uh, as our, uh, our, our partners and managers and our team to join uh, I Bailey and and again, uh, these are all really really good quality people and um, we're we're very excited for our HMWC clients who are listening um, to let you know that we're going to have a lot more tools in our tool belt. I just do want to share that uh, nothing is going to change for you other than quite honestly the name on the billing and the name of the company you write the check to. Uh, our team is all here. We're all uh, we've all come over. We're all working. We're all getting stuff done. Uh, this week, we've been figuring out all the new technology that they have, which is really exciting. I, I learned how to I, I, I learned how to record my podcast on Microsoft Teams yesterday, and it's really slick. So there's a lot of really cool things that we're going to do. So uh, Scott, it's great to be part of your team. I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to working with you personally. You and I have been interacting and it's going to be great. So um, if any of you have questions, give us a call. All right. Now, you might have heard that there's another stimulus package on the forefront. So uh, go back and remember that on the 27th of March, uh, Congress passed and the president signed unanimously. Everybody voted for it because they knew they had to. 
a $2.2 trillion uh, package called the CARES Act, which had money for the airlines and for PPP and for the provider relief fund, which we're gonna talk about and all this stuff. Um, well, uh, the, the deal is, is that, um, the deal is, is that uh, we're not done yet. And Megan, I guess uh, they're talking more stimulus. So the $600 weekly unemployment payment that's been keeping tens of millions of Americans afloat since this happened uh, expires or sunsets uh, next week. So, um, you know, they're, they need to do something now and they're talking. So let's go to the next slide, Amy. And um, so, Megan, I'm going to let you jump in and do a lot of this lifting here. Um, is uh, so, I put a slide together and said, "What did the Democrats want?" So they passed uh, the Heroes Act about a month ago, right? Just the House. I, I mean, the, I mean, the House did. The, the House did, and the House obviously is Democratic. And again, we're not talking politics, folks. I promise, we're not talking politics. Mm -hmm. Um, so they wanted additional stimulus payments, funding for testing. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service is in serious, serious trouble financially, has been for years. Uh, they wanted to fund a trillion dollars to state and local governments. Uh, California had a $22 billion surplus on February 1st. They are now $52 billion in the hole, uh, laying people, talking about laying people off. Uh, funds to support healthcare providers, which is what the the um, uh, the HHS uh, provider relief fund is doing, uh, essential workers hazard pay, housing assistance, and they wanted to expand the unemployment kicker. I think Megan into next was it like March of 2021? Yeah, they'd like to expand it as long as they can. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Now the Republicans, what did they want? Now this, this slide talks about what they were talking about, but this is not what's happening, which we're gonna to get to in a second. Uh, the president and um, the, the leadership in the, in the Senate and the Republicans did not wanna go over a trillion dollars. Uh, testing is not a big priority to them, although that may have changed in the last week, who knows? Um, they're talking about Megan unemployment benefits uh, reducing them, not doing the 600 because it's a disincentive. Possibly They're trying, they might also try tie it to specifically to states to make their decision themselves, as opposed to the federal government doing a blanket 200 to 400. They may say, based on the individual state and the uh, situation there, it may be regional. There's lots of different proposals on how to not only lower the UI, but also make it more cost efficient, if that makes sense. Because some areas of the country, $600 is what you need to survive and other areas, a $600 increase over what you get from unemployment puts you into a better financial position than you've ever been in before. So there's lots of those discussions. And, and Scott, the Republicans also want liability protection for businesses, right? Yeah, it's a must. It's a, it's, there's, it's a non-starter for McConnell if there's no liability protections in there. Okay, next slide, please. So as of Thursday afternoon, Megan, uh, the Republicans, we got some uh, uh, we got some different factions of the GOP that are not liking the additional debt and stuff. And Mr. McConnell may, and they're talking about smaller bills. Pelosi says no way, right? So yeah, we heard that they are going to break it up into eight smaller bills that deal with each individual issues, liability protection, PPE reforms, tax credits, um, and then debate them individually from there, which would then punt any sort of vote on a pa package until September. Um, but as you have aptly said, these unemployment benefits run out of, of next week. So are we going to do like just a smaller bill on UI next week and then wait for a larger package later? It's really all in the air right now. And payroll tax cut is out as of today. Um, the GOP doesn't want to go forward with it. So at least that's been solved. So my, my, guess, my guess, Megan, is they're going to do the unemployment because they have to do that. And that may be all they do. Who knows? I mean, is this a firm August, July 31? They're on, they're on hiatus. They're done. No. They so they'll be, so I, we're definitely going to extend it into the first week of August. They're not going to do their recess, recess right away. Um, and it's been talked of that they might do two weeks um, of August, which nobody wants on Capitol Hill, but they, they can't go away without doing some things um, because we're just seeing 
the economy go back down, the downturns happening in a lot of areas are getting lots of pressure from the states. I would be shocked if they walked away without doing anything before the election or before, you know, September. And then what or happens in September, September, October? They're back in session, but they're all out campaigning, right? Because the because you know, remember, this is a presidential year, so one third of the Senate is up in the entire House. So so does does it work? I mean, you've been in Washington. I, I have not been. Uh, in September and October, does it just mean that not a whole lot gets done? Well, not a whole lot of the sexy stuff gets done, but appropriations and other things that are must-haves that people don't often pay attention to, you know, out in, in public world, but that is really important in terms of making sure that the government maintains its operations. Those kinds of things will happen, but anything controversial, anything, you know, and neither side wants to give each other a win. So this is going to have to be a bill where pretty much everybody's a little bit unhappy with the outcome in order to make it palatable for everybody. I, I, I've, been a media, I've been a mediator in dental disputes, and that's exactly what I've talked to professional mediators, is that you know, you, you've done a really good job if every, both sides are a little bit upset. So, um, but the bottom line is what we're concerned about, Scott, is you know, do we get a tax credit for PPE? Do we get to deduct the PPP expenses? Now, Megan, that's a, uh, I mean, it's got traction, but. Uh, it was in a summary yesterday that was a GOP priority is to ensure that any expenses paid for with PPP dollars would still be deductible. So that one and the $150,000 cap, those are the two things that we've been seeing kind of repeated in GOP speak when it comes to PPP. And we'll talk about that a little later. I want to move through these because I want to make sure Jamie has plenty of time to do her Maybe thing. One question to follow up on that. Have they talked about HHS funds and making those a non-taxable grant? I saw on the website from HHS that it will be taxable income. Um, it's, it's one of the things that we've joined a coalition letter on. So yes, it's another thing being considered. But PPP has more of a history. And so people have already focused on that, whereas the provider relief taxes is almost a new issue. Okay, All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so this is where we're gonna spend the rest of our time before we go to my friend, Jamie. So as part of the CARES Act, and, and Scott, you want me to take this or you wanna take this? Well, I could, I could jump in. So we saw this as part of the CARES Act back in, in March and a lot of our medical practices and hospitals receive funds uh, from the Health and Human Services Department. Um, and it was mostly uh, earmarked for those organizations and so our team across the firm has been pretty familiar with this uh, part of the CARES Act for, for months now and some of the reporting issues uh, and, and dentists were unfortunately left out of this group when it first rolled out. But about a month ago, was it June 10th or so, they rolled this out to dentists who were uh, accepting Medicare, Medicaid and CHIP uh, for, for, from their, uh, their patients. And so that had been open for about a month. And then on July 10th, the program was essentially opened up to all dentists, um, almost all of them, um, that were providing services to patients around the country. And so that opened the doors to a, a lot more assistance for our clients across the board, because uh, I don't have too many that are accepting Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and so a lot of these uh, folks are now the beneficiaries of this additional income. But it does come with a lot of strings attached, a lot of restrictions, and I think items you need to be aware of before you apply yeah. for the funds. So, so let's go to the next slide. And uh, you have until August 3rd to apply for this. It takes time. It's a, it's a portal. Uh, there's what, eight or nine different modules, I think, or some, something like that. So it's not something you're gonna do in 10 minutes. Um, so first, Scott, go through, go through, these are the six items that you must meet in order to be eligible to get this distribution as a dentist. Right, right. Yeah, number one is you hadn't received uh, any of the funds from that initial uh, $50 billion as part of the general distribution that occurred uh, in, in, in June uh, that we had previously mentioned, uh, along with that, that Medicaid and, and the CHIP distribution. And you have had to either file your federal income tax return for 17, 18, or 19, or being an entity exempt from the requirement to file a federal income tax return. This won't really apply to any of our dentists, but that first one does. Uh, so if you have your most recently filed income tax return, that's what you'll want to submit with your application. Uh, go ahead and head to the next slide. For uh, 
uh, the fourth requirement is you must have provided patient care uh, after January uh, 31st of 2020. So you couldn't cease providing that care um, and not be affected by the shutdown. Uh, they want any of those active dentists out there to be the ones that are applying for the funds. Um, and you must not have permanently ceased providing uh, the dental care throughout this pandemic. And so everyone's been opened up and, and we're now eligible for these funds. And that sixth uh, item down below, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a byproduct, I'd say, of number three, where if the applicant is an individual, so a number of docs out there are reporting their income and expenses from the dental practice on their Schedule C, on their personal return, uh, that's what this last requirement is, is indicating. So you'll need to report uh, that income uh, with application. So I have a question. So I have a client um, who has a four and a half million dollar practice. They got an automatic deposit of $154. I'm not kidding. From what we believe is the Medicare fund. They believe now where they would get, because remember, this has got 2% of their gross rate. It's the lesser of 2% of your gross revenues or the amount of revenues lost because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. And we know the 2% is always going to be low, the, the number. So they would be eligible for like a $90,000 grant. Now, I read, Megan, in the frequently asked questions this morning, that you can return the money if you within 90 days. I don't know if either of you, I don't know the answer to this, but if any of you, because because they got this money deposited into their account automatically, they didn't ask for it, they just got it. So do, do either of you guys, I don't know the answer. We are aware of this problem. Um, ADA, this is a, what, another one besides the fire that we just put out this week on, um, <laughs> The fire that we just had to put out this week on the uh, balance billing issue, this is the second part of the, the ask that we have because we have a number of dentists and larger dental practices that did um, have a few Medicare patients that got a very small payment that could have gotten very big dollar amounts out of this and feel like it's unfair because it was automatic. So we have flagged this for HHS and we're hopefully working through this issue. For now, you can return the money, but there's still going to be an impetus where it's probably going to deny you because you've already been given money and you're going by your tin. So just tell people to be a little bit patient. I know that's hard. And I know it's August 3rd is fast approaching, but we're hopeful that they can come up with some sort of remedy for this in the next few days. Now, there's, a, there's a phone number that I actually called two days ago, uh, which is, which is uh, uh, housed by, they said, United Healthcare and HHS, HHS, and so I talked to them. So there's an actual phone number, and I think, you think I, I, I was gonna give it out because it's, it's on the website. Um, it's 866-569-3522. And this is the Provider Support Helpline, help line. okay? And, and, and that's, that's what that is. And I actually got a hold of a live human being type person, and we talked about some issues. And if you give them your ID number, uh, they can talk about your individual situation. Um, but yeah, so Megan, you're saying that it may very well, yeah, let me type this in the chat. Well, I mean, if they can go to United and United can solve it themselves by maybe you know erasing your original application. So United has been brought on for the dental distribution as the, the entity that is distributing the funds. So that's how they got involved this contract with the federal government to do that. There was a number of different entities um, competing to do that. So if United can fix that, did they say they could fix the problem or they could just look into it? No, they can look into it. So I just, so I just put on the chat, folks, it says from me to all panelists, uh, the phone number 866-569-3522. So that's on there for you. That's also on the HHS's website. All right, so let's go to the, let's go to the next slide and let's keep talking about this for a couple minutes. So basically, Scott, keep going. I mean, there's, so it's 2% of revenues. You have to do it by August 3rd. Um, you have to go through and fill all this out. You meet these, um, uh, the provisions. And so go ahead, Scott, let's start talking about some of these terms and conditions. Yeah, the terms and conditions, and there's some comical ones in there that maybe Art can talk about uh, briefly. But number one is one of the conditions is your, uh, the amount that's awarded to you will become public knowledge. Uh, and so, so anybody who wants to know how much revenue you're typically receiving per year, uh, they can back into that number knowing that uh, this is 2% of your revenue. So that will become public. 
much like PPP uh, recipients, uh, funds that they've received is public knowledge, even though the database is uh, monstrosity, so it'd be tough to find uh, folks' names there, uh, but it will be public knowledge. There are reporting requirements. Do we know what those reporting requirements are for the dental community? Um, we don't know if they're gonna be the same as other medical practices or not. Uh, I think I read somewhere, and, and Megan, maybe you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought they said something around the lines of, you can start doing your reporting requirements in October, and you'll have more information about those requirements for the dentist uh, before that point. So. I'm not sure if it'll be the same or different. Um, I'm assuming the funds that most folks are gonna be receiving will be spent relatively quick on uh, COVID related supplies or that lost revenue. So um, I, I don't think the amount of funds will be as, as large as some of those larger healthcare groups that uh, HHS really wants to track. Um, and then the funds, you can't double dip with the funds. You can't use them for the same expenses that you use for uh, the PPP loans and idle. Um, so those are some of the, some of the major ones that you really need to be aware of out there and we'll, we'll get to the balance billing, uh, in one of the next few slides here too. Yeah, let's go, let's go ahead and go to the next slides. I'm looking for the provision that has to do with chimpanzees. I can't, <laughs> right. um, something Sam. that you can't, what is it? You can't spend money on chimpanzees or something like that. Um, you can't do illegal drugs. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I can't find it right now, but it's, it's pretty comical. Okay, so basically, um, Megan, maybe you want to kind of explain how this balanced billing issue works, and uh, then we can kind of see where it's going, or do you want me to do that? How do you want to do this? No, that's fine. So we got this flagged literally the day this portal opened, the Enhanced Provider Relief Portal opened by, I forget, it was a dentist who was really, you know, going through the fine tooth comb of the terms and conditions. And we assumed that we were, um, we had always been under the assumption that whatever questions weren't included in the dental distribution FAQ, we could always rely on what was in the, uh, you know, previous provider relief on FAQ for medical providers, because why would we be any different? But, um, and we were told that by a number of legal entities, you know, don't worry about this balance billing issue. You're not going to be beholden to dental insurance prices, if you are fee for service or anything like that, it's, it's really, it's, but we needed it to be definitive for dentists and in our FAQ. So there was a concern that if you took this money, that you would have to ensure that you only charge prices in line with whatever was going on in the insurance, the dental insurance company in your area or whatever, even if you didn't accept them. Um, this is not the case. It's only if you're treating active or presumed COVID cases, which I'm very hopeful that none of my dentist members are treating active COVID or presumed COVID patients. So it's really a protection for the patient who is getting care from a provider in a hospital or a different setting who is a COVID patient to ensure that they're not seeing these enormously large bills without being forewarned ahead of time. Because oftentimes people are going to stay in the hospital for days or weeks and are seeing crazy bills. I, I mean, I think the intention of this, Megan and Scott, was for the, the patient who, God forbid, ends up with a severe case, they need to be in ICU, they go to their hospital, the hospital is overloaded, there's no place, so we got to send them 50 miles down the road, and they're out of network. I think that was the intention, wasn't it? Totally the intention. I mean, it really, and think about it, it makes sense. First of all, we're dealing with an illness that has, still has lots of questions. So we don't, we have a bunch of different specialists having to weigh in. A lot of people are seeing neurological issues. They are seeing gastrointestinal issues. I mean, you can have a patient that has to see every specialist in the hospital and you can't guarantee if those, pa those specialists are in network. And right now, hospital administrators, if they're overrun, are not double checking and informing patients because they don't have the time and they're just trying to save people's lives. So this was really that intent. This is not for dentists. And again, please don't treat active COVID patients or no, presumed no, no, COVID no, no, patients no, no, in your no, practice. No, 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 no. Don't and treat them. I think Jamie don't will say that too. Don't bring your champ chimpanzees near them. Don't do anything, right? Okay, next slide. So basically, um, you know, ADA and HHS have been working very closely together. And yesterday, HHS published a revised question and answer on the balanced billing issue. And so here's the link to the HHS website for their frequently asked questions, which will answer a lot of questions for you if you have trouble sleeping. And then uh, next slide. So this is, this is what the deal is. So basically HHS, was it yesterday, came out with the, an answer to this. And uh, Scott, you wanna, you wanna take us through this one, basically? 
Sure. Yeah, this is this is kind of hits on the head of, of what Megan was talking about with the balance billing um, and talking about, OK, what's what's presumptive cases of COVID mean? Well, everybody who walks in our dental office, we could presume they uh, have COVID. And does that mean that uh, these folks well, we can't we can't uh, charge them for the, the out of network costs? And so um, a lot of our docs would be losing out on on revenue that that they've typically received before. And so uh, when, when you get down to that, that last part there, uh, the last bullet point, uh, qualifying for payment from the provider relief fund has to do with past treatment earlier this year when HHS broadly viewed every patient as possible case of COVID. The balance billing uh, pro prohibitions apply only to treating the current active COVID-19 patients with a me medical record that supports a diagnosis of COVID-19. And so in that case, it gets a little bit more sticky there uh, where, where you can't charge them for the out-of-network uh, costs. Is that correct from my understanding there, Megan? I'm, I guess I'm, what's the question about whether or not if they, if they were a past COVID patient correct. and they had been treated? I, I don't know. I don't see how that would be applicable to a dental visit. But um, if it's in the patient's medical record, that's what it says. If you but I feel like it's tied to treatment for COVID. I don't feel like it's tied for treatment outside. That wouldn't really make any sense. But we can further clarify that. I mean. But, but, but look at that. It says where a patient's medical record documentation supports a diagnosis. A dentist is not going to diagnose COVID-19. That's not what they do. Also, does that's, your dentist have your medical records? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, so I, I. I, I truly think that this was, um, you know, not intended for, in fact, doesn't it say in the, in fact, Amy, go ahead and put up that, that thing from the ADA news yesterday, um, if you could. And, and it, it says in there that um, it, it is not believed that dentists will have to deal with this balanced billing issue. That, that's what- We've, that's we've been told in the emails- yeah, we've been told in emails by HHS staff that de this is not applied to dentistry and that was not an intent. So I know that this says it. It's again, when we had PPP, we had some sloppy rollout of some language that we were like, wait, what? Right. Um, so remember, this has only been out for 14 days now. And uh, I just, we've been re reassured that this is just not applicable to our profession. So I never read that bullet with pause. I always just assumed it meant like, if you have, were a COVID patient and say you have a resurgence of the COVID illness, you're not going to get treated for that at a dental offices. I feel like that's intended for anything connected to the COVID case, not necessarily. Right. Uh, procedure. Right. So the, the bottom line with this, because I, I do want to get to Jamie, uh, the bottom line of this is, folks, you must read. Let's go back to the PowerPoint, if you would. Uh, you must read your terms and conditions. There are lots of terms and conditions in this. Uh, there are, there's documentation required that you're gonna have to provide quarterly information. The HHS technically has access to looking at your books and records. Uh, the one thing, Scott, that I've been telling my clients is that you're not allowed to use this money for anything that you're using other government aid for, which are EIDL loans, PPP loans, uh, chimpanzee loans, any loans that you get, you're not allowed to use this for. So what I'm telling doctors, because the amount of money is not a huge amount of money, um, is use it for nothing but PPE equipment and supplies. Just put it in an account, use it only for masks, gowns, etc. You're going to spend it. Just use it for that. Use it for only that. And I can't see any way where they would have a problem with that. Do you guys? That'll make the reporting a lot easier too. So yeah. within your accounting software, you know, if we're doing your books for you, uh, we'll make a new account and title it PPE uh, expenses or COVID expenses, and then easily track it there. Make it. Yeah, and I would, I would just like to say that the ADA still strongly recommends that people apply for and receive this. You have 90 days to return it if for some reason the terms and conditions that come out are um, you know, uncomfortable for somebody, but we strongly recommend all of our provider friends who have gotten this money from the Provider Relief Fund have you know, touted the fact that they think that it was beneficial to them and haven't really discussed much in terms of consternation over reporting requirements. So 
I, and that may not be everyone's position, but the ADA is firmly behind this program and works, you know, with HHS to make sure this happens. I think I feel the same way. Scott, how do you feel? Yeah, yeah, I feel the same, yep. All right, let's go to the next slide. Real quick here, a couple more things that we want to talk about. Uh, PPP forgiveness might get easier. Megan, yes, maybe, we hope. I think so. I think for loans under $150,000, there's a really good chance that it's going to be either like a super easy process or they're just going to forgive it outright. Yeah. So basically, that's over 80% of the loans. Um, do you think this is going to be part of this? Well, we don't know what we're going to have, but... We're going to wait for the relief package to see this. I think UI might be the only... Unemployment, you know, or benefits may be the only thing that we see in a standalone bill that passes maybe before the end of the month. But because the PPP loan forgiveness has now been extended for so long, there's not as much of a um, motivation to get it done in the next few weeks. Um, however, they do want to make sure they have something in place in case there's another downturn and people need to apply um, for additional funds. But I expect this to be in a larger package. That could well, change, no. but I expect it to be part of a larger package and not a standalone. So if they do this, I apologize to 90% of our clients in advance for all that has been, you have been put through with this thing. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but it is what it is. And the government is trying. I mean, this is an unprecedented pandemic and um, let's hope that they pass this law. Let's go to the next slide. And the, okay, so we're gonna do a polling question. So how do we do this, Amy? <laughs> All right, so in the middle of your screen is a box and it should allow you to click on it. And it says, have you received your HHS funds? And you can pick which one you'd like. And then I guess when we're, when we're done, we'll report back the results of the, of the poll, the percentages and stuff. Correct, we'll okay. leave it open for about 30 seconds. All right. Okay, so while we're doing this, I think, uh, oh, we had one more thing that I think is on here is um, they've shut down the $10,000, $1,000 per person idle grants, uh, Megan, I believe. Yeah, they ran out of money and quietly didn't tell anybody about it. Um, I saw like one article about it and then I was like, oh, okay. And I went on the site and it's officially run out of money. You can still get an idle loan. There's just no money left for the advanced slash grant. All right, so that's interesting. We got about a third, a third, a third, a third, not yet, a third they're going to, and a third that they're not, 35%. Wow, interesting. Okay, well, let's get to, uh, and Amy, I might want to go five or no more than five or 10 minutes over if that's okay today. Of Is that going to be? Thank yep. you. Okay, so I would like to now introduce my good friend, um, Jamie Marbo, RDHBS, um, uh, which stands for Bachelors of Science, folks. That doesn't stand for anything else you might think of. Uh, Jamie has almost, Jamie is with a company called Inspired Hygiene, and I've known Rachel Wall, their founder, um, for many, many years. I've known Jamie for many, many years. So let me introduce her and let her get right to this information. Uh, we're talking about the hygiene department is the lifeblood of your dental practice. Jamie, Jamie Marbo has almost 40 years experience in dentistry. During this time, she's been a hygiene consultant, licensed hygienist, university clinic instructor, certified EagleSoft, software trainer, and dental assistant. Jamie graduated with a Bachelor's of Science with an expanded functions license from Idaho State University. She's an international speaker and lead productivity coach with Inspired Hygiene. With such a comprehensive background, she enjoys going into private practices, coaching the entire team on how to gain and maintain passion with their careers and become the best version of themselves. Jamie also strongly believes that very little can be accomplished without strong leadership and team positive synergy. She's actively involved with the Dental Speakers Bureau, Dental Speakers Institute, and the Speaking Consulting Network Group. She also enjoys being a frontline skills communication coach with Lion Speak. Ooh, Miss Catherine Itell. Hi, huh, Jamie? Yeah. She's my buddy. I yeah. love Catherine. She's as good as it gets. Welcome, Jamie. Welcome thank to you. I Bailey. Thank you, thank you. I just want to check: is my sound okay? And can you guys see my my main yep. screen instead, and not my presenter's view? We see your presenter's view. Okay, let's see if I so can. So we're good. So Jamie, the floor is yours, and uh, Scott and I and Megan will jump in as necessary. But uh, tell us how we can have better hygiene departments. Okay, let me just swap my screens out here really quick, if you don't mind. I'm going to. Let's see if it'll let me. 
do this. Should have tested this part out before. Go ahead and go up to the top. And you see the mm -hmm. display settings? Okay. Click I that. Have, uh, mm -hmm. Display setting. There we go. Yep. yep. Click swap. that and swap. Thank you. Man, I wish I had a little uh, Amy voice in the background for me all the time. <laughs> oh, no. I, Amy is my, Amy and Megan, my two newest bestest friends. You know, I, yeah, yeah, that's kind of nice. I really like that. So I've got dual monitors going so that I can uh, be looking at my uh, my notes and stuff. But thank you so much, Art. I really appreciated you reaching out to us um, and and getting me on here. Um, I, I really, um, the information that you guys presented is invaluable and um, your uh, all of your clients are in very good hands. And uh, so today I'm going to be talking on what's called ROH and it's the return on hygiene. And um, a lot of you have heard of ROI, right? And uh, Rachel Wall came up with this book. She wrote this book called Return on Hygiene. And um, I'll tell you how you can get your hands on the book after um, the, towards the end of the uh, presentation. But I wanted to, before I jumped right into the presentation, I wanted to um, start off by talking about something that is really, um, somewhat alarming across our country with what we're now referring to as an upcoming hygiene pandemic. And so I'm going to show you a few, um, a few of the slides here on how we can, um, first I want to bring it to your attention. And I don't know how many of uh, your um, clients have dental and tail, but this is how we have figured this out that this is going on. Hang on. Uh, my arrow's not wanting to Let me make sure. There we go. So um, what we're uncovering is that whenever, when post-COVID and we opened up our offices again, we have um, these patients that, of course, we couldn't see in March, April, May, depending on when you opened up, maybe even part of June. And so what we have uncovered is that there's a there's going to be a short of shortage of hygiene um, visits coming up in the next few months, like September, October, November. So I'm going to just show you some of, of what we have. And I just, this is some screenshots of one of my clients who um, you can see where I've circled in September of 2019, they had scheduled in just, it's just hygiene. They had 484 patients scheduled a year ago, September. And this is what the prediction is. And it's, I'm going to keep going through the next few months. 376 are scheduled for this September, which is only a little over a month away. You know, we're almost to August right now. Here is September of 2019 for my this practice. 587 were scheduled. And this is what is alarming. Look at what is scheduled for October of 2020. And I'm showing you this not to cause any alarm what this is so that you can be proactive. So here is November of 19 scheduled and here is what we have in November of 20. Here is December of 19 and here is what this practice has in December of 20. Now again, I don't want you to be alarmed, but what we're what we're wanting to do is have you be proactive. And so there's a few things that that I that we are coaching our clients on in how you can get the schedule back filled back up because it makes sense right that six months from now is going to be in January. So if you started in June or if you opened up in May, it'd be December. So um, a couple of things that you can do if you have a strong perio program um, that has perio, a lot of perio maintenance patients, then these numbers aren't going to be as staggering because they're coming in every three months. It's our adult profies that are six months out. And so we had that lag time, however long you were closed. And so those months that were six months out are the ones that are suffering, of course, that goes without saying. But a lot of us are not, are not paying attention to this. So we're having our, um, our clients do an email campaign first to any of their unscheduled um, patients that are past due. Um, I know a lot of offices are still trying to catch up with getting some of their um, uh, patients in that fell through the cracks um, during the closure. 
Um, but the other thing is once, once we are contacting these patients, A, if they're past due, you can get them in during those months and you would want to do a mass hygiene uh, or excuse me, email campaign. The other thing we're suggesting is that you find out which of your insurance providers have a two, um, they have two per calendar year profies versus the six months and a day. Because we could really use um, that as a driving force that this is a benefit that has been given to you, but you haven't, um, you're, you're, you're going to lose it. So you don't have to go six months. We can actually see you in four months or five months. And here's some of the benefits of coming in a little sooner that, that will benefit you. It could be something like, you know, you last time you were in, you had a, a cracked tooth. You had some sensitivity. And, you know, we could take a good look at that. It could be that you had 20 points of bleeding last time. We, we introduced a water pick. So why don't we get you scheduled now and not wait six months? Let's get you scheduled earlier and let's see how your health is doing. We now know that these high-risk pathogens are, are we're breathing, we're, we're swallowing these high-risk pathogens. And we know that with everything that's going on in the world right now and with the oral and systemic link is, you know, it might be a great idea for you to come in and let Jamie you know, help uh, reduce those high risk pathogens that you sh that you uh, showed in in your appointment last time. So again, this isn't to to scare you any at all, but it's to have you guys get on top of this right now because it it is real. It is happening across the board. We have, you know, probably 50, 60 clients at Inspired Hygiene right now, and the ones that have the higher perio percentage aren't seen as much of an issue. It's the ones that still have the lower perio percentage and they're doing a lot of adult profies. That's, those are the offices that we're seeing um, these staggering numbers um, with. Jamie, let me jump in and ask a couple of questions. Number one, I'm a big Dental Intel fan and I use it with my clients. One of the things with Dental Intel that I love is you can look at the reappointment percentage. That's part of the issue of what, and I don't know if you're gonna talk about that today. Um, but that's one thing. Is that is that part of the reason that you're seeing maybe fewer appointments? Well, no, not really, because this is all directly affected by the closure. These the closure. are all six months. It's six months from March, six months from April, and six months from May, and maybe part of June. Right. So it they couldn't be reappointed. And so they're getting a lot of these patients in, but then they're putting them out six months from this appointment date. Not which from could what cause problems. Yeah, it's not from their original. So if I was due in March, but I didn't get in until July, they're reappointing me in, in January. And it, we it, need it, to, when we're reappointing, we need to talk to these patients in the chair about how, you know, this is a benefit you're going to possibly lose. We could get you in in three months. We could do X, Y, and Z. We could get you back and do that FMX that you were due for. And we were, we were going to do it in six months. We can do that in, in October. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a good point. The other thing that might be causing this is the fact that I'm hearing that a lot of doctors are, are, are making their hygiene appointments five or 10 or 15 minutes longer than they were before COVID uh, because of the change in the PPE equipment and the education and that they have to listen to everybody's COVID life story. And you can't say, you know, I got a business to run. I can only see you for this amount. So please don't talk about your life. You can't do that, right? right. Is that part of this too? Um, is uh, that, ask that last part of the video. I mean, that, that, that they have fewer, maybe fewer appointments because they've got longer time periods for the hygienists to see the patients. Yeah, it, obviously there's, there's less patients that they're seeing. Some of that is being lifted the, in some of the states by their, um, their state, you know, ADA or excuse me, their state, um, board of dentistry, but, um, not all states. So every state is different on that. And so of course, when we first started out, like here in Idaho and Montana, we were closed for seven weeks. Unfortunately, states like New York and um, Connecticut and Michigan were closed for almost three months, if not three months. So, um, and, and when I want to go back to your other statement, if we're not pre-scheduling these patients, yes, moving forward now, January, excuse me, January, February, March. Yeah, those that that's going to impact that. But what we're really working about, worried about, is this hygiene pandemic for the fall. Right, right. So we've got to be proactive. We've got to even if you hire or have somebody that's designated, because we're talking, they can't be on the phone to to calling four hundred patients. So what they're going to have to do is when they have the patients that they're getting in now that that were not seen during the closure. 
they need to bring some of these things up and then also do an email campaign and then start calling. And what I would do on Dental Intel is when you look at those patients that are past due, and you can find that in your software too, but Dental Intel ties it up in a really nice little bow for us. When you go to your patients who don't have a future hygiene visit or a past due one, look to the side and Dental Intel, it shows you if they have outstanding treatment. Right. So it shows if they have treatment that has not been scheduled. And those would be my go-tos. If they have no balance and they have outstanding treatment, that way we can get them in and we're also feeding the doctor schedule down the road. And, and for those of you that don't know what dental intel is, it is a dental dashboard that will sync with EagleSoft, Dentrex, or Open Dental. It will not sync with any other programs as I understand it. And it is a tool that I have been waiting, and you and I, Jamie, have been waiting for for 35, 40 years oh in our God. practices. And so it is, and there are other dental dashboards out there, but Dental Intel is the one that I think has got the most traction. I think they have about 5,000 practices they work with. And, and it's got a lot of really good stuff. I'm not promoting on this you know, webinar. It's just something that, that, that a lot of the coaches, uh, uh, Jamie, myself, other people work with. So anyway. Yeah, it, it has changed my life as a coach. It has saved me hours and hours and hours of the dinosaur tracker it, it <laughs> my, it's my it's my fingers on the pulse and it's not just for me i mean it saves hours for your office manager or for your cpa that are trying to get you know number real live numbers instead of waiting for a monthly report and have it already be outdated i can see their schedule everything and again i'm not here to promote it either but it really is something to look into um and i'm sure that they get some sort of a discount if they are affiliated with you know with you 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 and your firm there um debbie asked me what screen i used um for uh to find these numbers with dental intel so i'm guessing that you have dental intel it's right on the very front screen on the um, performance board it is yeah. the top left hand thing that says patient visits and then you click on hygiene, the purple, there's a little purple dot. So that's what I did. And then I just went back and forth, toggled back and forth between the date, because you can now look at it by the week, by the month, or by the year. So I just toggled back and forth and made it, th that's what made it so easy. Okay. Okay. Great. So I'm going to get into, there's a lot of questions that we could be asking or that I could be answering about COVID. I'm sure that a lot of you guys have already, you know, answered or had those those types of questions answered well before hopefully you opened and i know that once you opened you probably also had um you know you have s some other issues that have cropped up i am happy to answer those questions um you know at the end of the program if that's okay what i'd like to do and i wish i could wave a magic wand and don't think i have my head in the sand um, but i would like to be able to um, move on and kind of talk to you as if COVID didn't happen with just your return on hygiene and your numbers. Is that okay, Art? Yeah, absolutely. Jamie, you are, anything you want to do is fine with me. Okay. Um, for some reason now, my, my slide's not advancing. That's really crazy. Um, hang on. We'll probably go 10 times now. Watch. <laughs> so I've been pushing the button. Um, but, but one of the things that you might be wondering why Art you know, invited me to come and, and speak or inspired hygiene, come and speak. And, and you've done this on your podcast. You've done this too, you know, uh, with, with us before, like you said, but the main reason I say is because it's because your CPAs know enough about dental. That's why you're, they're your CPA. And they believe strongly that the hygiene department is the backbone um, of their of your uh, office and what happens in the hygiene department or doesn't happen in the hygiene department is will really affect the whole rest of the practice. Um, and you would agree with that statement, wouldn't you? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I've always said, you know, there's three things in the hygiene and I'll let you work on your PowerPoint. I'll talk for a second. Um, I've always said I was part of the pride Institute for many years and they, they mm -hmm. taught me that a hygiene department gives you three opportunities. Uh, it's a revenue source, it's a source for new work and it's a source for asking the patient for a referral. Uh, and they, they've taught that for years and years and years. You may not teach it exactly that way, Jamie, but um, hygiene is so important. And it, 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 it kind of disturbs me a little bit how a lot of doctors um, kind of downplay it mm -hmm. uh, and they don't think it's important. And so anyway. 
Yeah. And, and I think that they all would agree that they, that in some, at some point they know that if something's going to awry in their schedule, that it's probably um, due to something that has happened in hygiene. Maybe it's been a pregnant hygienist that's been out on and they didn't fill her schedule. You'll see that affect directly the doctor's um, uh, book, his, you know, the restorative of his or her. And then also you'll see six months, three to six months down the road, there will also be a decline in um, appointments being uh, scheduled. And, and so, so it really does have a lot of an impact on, I'm going to reshare here. Hang on. I'm sorry, guys. Don't know what's happened. It's like all of a sudden my uh, nothing's moving forward or advancing. Okay. Do you want to try to advance it before you share it? Yeah. Let's see here. I'm going to try it one more time this way. Can you see that yet? Mm -mm. No. no. Okay. Hang on. Sorry, guys. You'd, act, you'd think I haven't ever done this before. I'm just going to unplug my monitor. I know enough that I don't need my notes. So I'm just going to unplug this and I'm just going to share my screen from where we're at. Okay. So we'll start from my last slide. There we go. Okay. Let's see if this works a little better. Okay. Is that good? Yep, looks we good. Can see it. Yep. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So, so a lot of times, that's why even just bringing up what we're finding on this hygiene schedule pandemic that we're talking about is that if we don't keep our finger on the pulse and we don't, and we just kind of go about feel, like with our feelings and we don't look at numbers, and I know that's what you guys, you know, coach your clients on is that they've got to they've got to pay attention to the numbers. And lots of times it's not, we, we try to tell ourselves that it's not about the money, right? We want to make money and we want to provide good services. And um, so we just kind of have a feeling of what's happening until you hire a, a CPA firm like yours art, you know, and you get somebody in there, you really, sometimes a lot of them are not really paying attention to their numbers. And that's not just from dollars and cents. It's also numbers that, come up with your hygiene recare effectiveness. How about what, uh, how many, what is your perio percentage? Um, what is your uh, supply and demand? You know, do you offer this, the right amount of hygiene appointments um, for how many patients you're actually seeing? And so I'm going to go over some of those things with you today so that you guys can go back, pull up some of your own numbers and um, see where you at, get, get that reality check going. Okay. So the biggest thing we, we find is that when we went to dental hygiene school, went to dental school, our why was probably a little blurry. We thought, yeah, I'm going to be a dentist. I'm going to help people feel better about their smiles. I'm going to save teeth. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, be a, remove calculus. And, but our why compared to when we graduated from to now, it's changed. And if it hasn't changed, then I, I would be a little concerned because we really didn't know, you know, whenever we go into our private coaching clients, I on, constantly get from the dentist and the hygienist, especially, um, well, why did they teach us in hygiene school? You know, and it's like, because they only want, they really have one job and one job only. And that is to get you through your college education and for you to be able to pass your boards. And what, and if I ask all the dentists on this, are you practicing dentistry the same as you did in, in school? You'd always say, no, I know you would. But when it comes to, because you guys, you know, we didn't have implants, you know, we didn't have the pinpoint, um, you know, tissue grafting. We didn't have any of these, a lot of these things that we have now, um, LANAP, laser atta new attachment procedure. And yep. so dentistry has gone like that. There, you do, your, your needle has moved a lot, but in hygiene, unfortunately, it's kind of uh, like this. And so that's what Inspired Hygiene is trying to do is to get that needle moved just like it is with dentistry because we shouldn't be practicing dental hygiene like we did when we graduated. So ROH, what we talk about here is what is your vision? So what is your vision? And I would like you guys, if you have a pen and paper, I'd like you to write down some things here. So what is your vision for your patients? Just take a minute and think. And I know... And, and again, I, I, I would like to wave that magic wand and say that, you know, that this is based on non pre 
pandemic, and I know that's maybe unrealistic, but but still, this is gonna this is gonna settle. And at the end of the day, you're still having to care for your patients, right? Whether we have PPE in place, whether it's COVID, whatever it is. But what is your vision for your patients? Write a couple of ideas down. And what is your vision for the providers in your office, for yourself, for your assistants, for your business team members, and your hygienists? What are some of your visions for them? And then what is your visions for your practice? Where would you like to see you grow? Having your dental CPAs helping you with that, they're going to help you with your vision for your practice when it comes to a lot of the numbers that you are going through. But what, if, what is the vision for the way it functions, your practice functions? What is your visions for the way the, the synergy, like I talked about, the leadership? You know, what are the, those visions that you have for your practice? And if you haven't looked at your visions and you haven't actually put them in writing, I'm going to challenge you that sometime in the next week or two to, to start sit, sit down with your team members and go over some of these visions that you guys can create together um, as a team. So we have some rock star industry standards that we go by. And I'm sure that you've heard of some of them, but I'm gonna go into a little bit of a deeper dive on each one of them with you, okay? So our rock star standards for perio percentage is 30% or higher. Mm -hmm. The ADA says that we have somewhere between 60 to 85, depending on which report you read, um, Americans have some form of periodontal disease. And we're talking about bleeding gums. We're not necessarily talking about periodontitis. We're talking about active infection, which is bleeding. So they could have periodontitis with active infection, but it's somewhere between 60 to 85%, they're saying now. Recare effectiveness should be 65% or higher. That means how many active patients do you have that have been in in the last 12 months versus the ones that have not. Your profitability should be three to one. That means that a third goes to paying your hygienist salary and benefits. A third of it should go to your overhead for hygiene, um, uh, what you, you know, your sensors, your, you know, all of your supplies. And then a third of it you should be able to put into the bank. So that's the three to one profitability ratio. Your production should be collectible production, $1,200 a day or 150 to 175 an hour. Your open time should be no more than 10%. And if it's a much less than 8%, it's time to add hygiene hours. Your profi to perio maintenance ratio should be three to one. So you should be doing three adult profis to every one perio maintenance. The hygiene production should be somewhere between 25 and 30% of the total office production. Now, if you have several do specialty doctors or you're um, doing a lot, like you're a prosthodontist and you place a lot of implants, a lot of four by four, four by fours or whatever you do, you may not be able to have it be as up to 30%. You might be a little closer to the 25%. And your restorative treatment diagnosis out of the hygiene um, chair should be about 60%. So whatever it is that you are diagnosing, 60% of it should be coming out of the hygiene chair. So how do you measure up? That's the hardest part, right? And that's what we're here for. We're here to help you run those numbers and be able to figure that out. But you can pull up some reports and there are some things that I'm gonna offer you a special at the end of this that, can, that I can maybe help you run some of these numbers um, uh, at a, for a courtesy. And so how do you measure up? And, and that's the part of talking about with tracking your numbers. And, and Amy or somebody send me a, a note or burst in if I, I want to save about 10 to 15 minutes um, at the end. So for question and answers. So would you please um, stop me at whatever time that is that gives sure. us about 10 minutes left or 15 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you um, if the ADA says that somewhere between 60 to 85% of Americans have some form of active periodontal disease. Where's your numbers? What number are you, do you have going on? And typically when we come into these offices, we see a big gap. And we don't realize that there's a big gap because we're busy. We're keeping our nose to the grindstone. And we're, we're really worrying about, you know, um, keep staying on time and 
filling the doctor's schedule. And we are maybe doing perio maintenances. We are maybe doing, but when we really look at the numbers, we have to look at that percentage and see if there is a gap. Now, I did see that we had a hand raised. I'm going to finish this one part here. And then I think it was John, and I'll let you go ahead and ask your question, okay? So you have, the good news is if there's a gap, that means you have potential, right? So if you have a huge gap, that's okay. You can push the reset button and you can move forward with some training and with some mindset changes and tracking of numbers. It just means you have potential. So that's the good news is that we can push that pause or that reset button and move forward and say from this day forward, we're going to be realistic with what is disease and what is health because it's one or the other right? And we lots of times as hygienists, we kid ourselves because we see so much bleeding that we pay more attention to millimeters. And we just say, oh, you know, art's not bleeding nearly as much. You should have seen how much Jamie was bleeding my patient before. And so we, we don't mean to, but we, we might minimize art's bleeding, but he's still infected. He still has active disease. It, it doesn't mean he's healthy if he's bleeding, right? Right. So Jamie, do, do you see a lot of dentists and hygienists not probing as much as they should, or do most dentists probe? Because that's where you're going to see a lot of this. You're going to see a lot of this, and and there's a couple of things. So the answer to your question is yes, but I, I would say that not across the board. It's just we might see them probing once a year and never putting down bleeding points. Well, we don't treat millimeters. We treat bleeding. Right. So if you're not, if you're not, putting down and paying attention to bleeding. The other thing we find is that a lot of hygienists probe and they don't get a lot of BOP, but then they go and they pick up their instruments and all of a sudden the patient's bleeding like crazy. And there's a really good reason for that. And instead of backing out of it and saying, you know what, you didn't have a lot of bleeding during that probing, but man, I'm getting a lot of bleeding. They don't do that because they've already said, Hey, keep up the good work. You only had two areas that were bleeding. That's better than last time. Right. And, and in their mind, they only have 15 minutes left with the patient and they got to get to the next patient and they yep. got to turn the room over and they're missing a huge opportunity. Right. They, they are. And what's happening is that they think, well, I'll do it next time. I'll recommend it next time. Well, the same thing happens next time. And that's how you get in the profi trap. That's how you get in the profi trap. The other problem that happens, Art, is that they, a lot of these um, hygienists have been seeing this patient for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they've been doing super profis on them, and they don't know how to change the conversation. They don't know how to say things have changed and it's time to do something different, Art. You know what? If we keep well, doing what we've been doing, we're going to keep getting the same results and, and it's just not working anymore. They're, they're, they're afraid the patients say, well, wait a minute, I've been your patient for 20 years and you've never talked to me about this. Why suddenly now? And then the answer to that is, you know what? We've been paying attention to this. Do you remember last, last year we talked about the water pick and did you ever go get it? And are you using it? Um, and it's also a lot like art. It's like when you went to, you go once a year for your checkups and, you know, you had high cholesterol and, and uh, doctor says, eat well, do better, you know, and we got to keep this less cholesterol down. Well, that's me, like me saying, you know, we've got some bleeding in there. We need you to brush and floss better and get that water pit. Okay. And then the next time you go into the doctor, they're saying, you know what, it's just not working your diet, whatever you're doing. So we need to put you on medication or you have elevated blood pressure. We're going to try you exercise, eat right. We're going to try and get that under control. And after a certain point, you know, Art, we just got to do something different. That doctor made a different diagnosis, and that's what we're doing here. When I get Dr. Smith over, we're going to talk about the things that we can't keep under control. So that's the well, answer. We what I need to know is what city that is, because I want to make sure I don't go there, because I will drive through that bridge right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the good news. I'm going to help you close the gap. Does that make you good. feel a little bit better? Before I get to that city, please do. <laughs> okay. So... The thing I'd like to ask is what have you tried? And when I go to the, you know, we can open up right now and take two minutes and just talk about some of the things that you guys have tried so far to close that gap. Um, we can do that. John raised his hand and I don't know, I think it was John. So if you want, we could unmute some of you guys and if you'd like to ask a couple to do two that. questions, go ahead. We don't have the option to do that. They would have to put it through the chat or the question feature. Okay, okay then that's just fine. So if you want to put it in the question and then Amy, can you do me a favor and read mm -hmm. the questions and then, of course, um, and then, and I'll just keep going. Okay. Sounds so when good. you get a question, go ahead and stop me. So go ahead and put your question in the chat option, the chat box. Okay. John. Okay. 
So let's get really real on what's what's bone loss and what's not. And I know these are a little blurry because they're a real image and that I, you know, and I've expanded them. So they're not as clear as I'd like them. But I don't think it's it's hard to see that this person has advanced perio. And unfortunately, we sometimes, and what we find when we go into offices is that we wait until it's this to this point. And all of a sudden the patient's got diabetes and they've got high blood pressure and you finally decide to send them to the periodontist. And I used to work for a periodontist. And I always wonder why we wait so long as general practitioners to refer. And why are we not being a little more proactive in the non-surgical sense before we get to this spot, which, which we, we are, not everyone isn't, but I'm just saying, I do remember. And I thought, you know, if there was anything that I could, I could really, really go and try to make a difference on as a practicing hygienist, working in periodontal practices, going into the offices and getting really real on what's early bone loss. So I'm going to show you another slide. So these are slam dunks. These are easy, but I want you to look at this image because this image, thousands and thousands of offices across the country, are treating this as an adult prophy. And often they're not looking at what it what is really going on here before it gets too late. So I'm gonna, if you just kind of look at this for a minute, I'm gonna point out with some arrows here what we're looking at. So these these fuzzy areas where the crustal bone used to be nice and thick and filled in is now getting what we call, I call them bite marks, you know, punch marks. And that the thinness of that crustal bone is starting to appear. We don't look at it because it hasn't completely um, made it so that the that they have five and six millimeter pockets, but they're gonna have a lot of bleeding. And lots of times when we see this, this is what the perio chart looks like too. But then the uh, nose, yeah, and then the perfect. Nose, exactly, they're good. I, I used to tell my hygienist, if you say the number four, I'm going to punch you. <laughs> oh, no, you can't say that now. <laughs> no, I, know, I know, I know. But, but and then in the notes, they'll have, they'll put like that, that spot on that tooth right there. It must have just bled like crazy. And that's why the one they put in there. But then they go to their notes and they'll say moderate bleeding, localized posteriors. Well, why didn't we, why did we not put it into the, on the perio chart? because that's what we need. So our insurance companies are looking for three things. They're looking for to, to accept um, doing peri moving forward with periotherapy, 4341 or the D4342. They're looking for radiographic bone loss. They're looking for active infection, which is bleeding. And they're looking for four millimeters or, or deeper. Some insurance companies are denying four millimeter pockets, but that doesn't mean that you don't treat them. The AAP's, um, the AAP's staging and grading says that early is four millimeter pockets. So send a copy of what the AAP says, even if they deny it, have images, do whatever you can on these early stages to get reimbursement for your patients. But then you want to explain to the patient, you know what, the good news is we caught this at an early stage. So you'll have, you have minimum bone loss right now. And hopefully together by having this be a lifetime commitment of you coming in more often and you doing what you need to do at home and coming in here and I'll do what I'm supposed to do, we can keep this from progressing. There's a slight chance that you're, there is a chance that your insurance won't pay for this because we did catch it at the early stages, but this is going to save you money and health in the long run. Because if that patient, Jamie, misses their appointment, life happens, they come back a year from now, and now that four is a six or a seven, and they've got serious problem and serious bone loss, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then it's kind of like the Fram oil filter commercial, you can pay me now or you can pay me later, right? Yeah, exactly. And there's, there's nothing that's more affordable than prevention. Yeah. You know, and even if it's prevention, even though it's a therapeutic service that you're going to be doing, we're still preventing them from getting to the next level. Right. And then the other thing, speaking of x-rays, is that you cannot diagnose what you cannot see. So the insurance company will deny if you do not have radiographic evidence that shows all levels of bone. So we always recommend that you take vertical bite wings on your adult patients that do have bone loss. And you can, and I have some offices that just across the board say anybody above the age of 25 is now getting vertical bite wings. That way you don't have to question it or not, but you have to be able to have diagnostic quality images to send along with all of your claims. 
and, and it's a liability have, issue. It is. And the insurance companies are now, they have their own consultants that are going in and they're looking at images. And if they, if they paid you for four images and they are doing a, a, a they're doing a, a audit on your images. And if they see that they'll take like maybe a hundred or a thousand images. And if, if 20% of them are undiagnostic, like you took four bite wings and the molar shot and the premolar shot, there's no difference between them or they can't see all levels of bone or they're overlapped and you don't have it documented as to why they're overlapped and that you could not open up that contact. They're saying we want 20% refund on the, all the images in the last five years that we have um, paid you for. So they're getting real, they're getting real. And this is something I came up with because I'm a big vertical bite wing taker. I took this out in my operatory at one of my, at the office I was working at last. This is a size, um, a size adult size two in a horizontal position. And this is a, the next size smaller, size one. Look at how much bone, you get almost eight millimeters or more in length from maxillary to mandibular of bone by just using a size one in maybe somebody has tori or a smaller jawed person or female you could so there there's a lot of people say you can't take vertical bite wings but i'm here to tell you you can especially with all the new technology and the digital x-ray and everything yeah so we're going to move to the schedule because this is one of the barriers this is one of the issues that we're dealing with and a lot of us sometimes you know, pre-COVID would have a ghost town schedule, maybe the morning, maybe the whole day. And then the next day or the ne that afternoon, all of a sudden it's Grand Central Station. And so there's um, something we really recommend, um, highly recommend. It's one of the first things we go in and do before we ever go in to do an in-office training with our teens. And Debbie can attest to this. We put in priority care blocks. Your priority care blocks can be anything from periotherapy first and new patients. That's definitely has to happen. And you, you, honor those, those priority care blocks until two days, depending on how busy you are, up until two days before. And if they don't get filled with either the, the designated service, then you can open it up. But I have some offices that are so busy and they, are, they can't grow any more hygiene chairs, so they have to put in actual perio maintenance blocks for each hygienist and also reactivated um, blocks so that they can get patients in that slip through the cracks. Um, and then of course, large restorative cases on the doctor's side. And I highly recommend that you put the periotherapy um, priority care blocks across from a large restorative case, like an implant or root canals or extractions, where the doctor doesn't like to be interrupted. And then that way they don't have to go over and do an exam while the hygienist is doing periotherapy. Jamie, what do you say to a doctor who says, you know, I can't see all those hygiene checks. I can't add more hygiene days. It's Are you going to get into that? Well, I'll, no, you just ask these questions and I'll tell, and I'll tell you what I'd say. Well, that's because you have, you're running a profi meal. Yeah. You should not be doing that many. If you, if you have a proactive perio system in place, you should be able to have two, a, a perio block in the morning for each hygienist and a perio block in the afternoon. They're typically for two quads, an hour and a half. And that's, that's four. If you have two hygienists, that's four. Um, that's three, six hours of, of them seeing patients where you didn't have to do an exam, but right. you have to get to that point. So you're going to have to do exams because you have to glove up the, the hygienist can, can, uh, co-diagnose perio and crowns or whatever you want. As long as you glove up, there's only two States where you don't have to, but you glove up, you, you agree with the hygienist and then she can treatment or he can treatment plan it. So, so it's typically because if you have to do eight in eight exams at 16 exams a day, you don't have a good perio program. That's a, that's a good way to look to see. It means you don't have really a good perio program. It should be. So the more exams that the doctor is having to do, the less, the more we got to work on the perio program. Yep. Okay. Okay. So the, the scheduling barriers are actual adequate. They, you, you have to make sure you have adequate perio and new patient blocks at the very least, and that you guys are, that everybody's honoring those blocks. Do not allow them to move them up and down so that Mrs. Jones can go to, she, she only wants to see Jamie, and every Tuesday morning, that's my perio block, you know, uh, she, she has bridge. I'm not gonna move that, I'm gonna ask her to go to Wednesday, if at, at all possible. Not a bridge in her mouth, but she's gonna go play bridge, that's right. Play bridge, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pinochle, whatever. My job. Yeah. So open time contributors, what happens to having high open time is the patient doesn't value the appointment. They show up late and we teach them it's okay to change the original appointment time. 
There might be too many hygiene hours versus patients being seen. You definitely could be caught in the profi trap, which you've already talked about. And there might be a confirmation protocol that needs to be adjusted or looked at. So those are a lot of the, con the contribute contributors to um, having open type be higher. And I always go in and listen when we do our observation on the first day of our in-office visits. I'm not just observing hygienists. I'm listening to the business team answer the phone and what they say or don't say to the patient that's trying to change their appointment at the last minute. Um, and Catherine Itell always says, you know, the best thing you can say is, oh, I'm so sorry that you have a conflict. What can I do to help you keep that appointment? Because there's just no way that I can fill it today at this last minute. I and just that. stop. And let that. them feel a little uncomfortable. And all of my offices that I'm that I'm that are using this are saying, I am getting at least 50% of my patients changing their mind and saying, you know what? I, I, you're right. I don't want to put you in a bind. You know, I, I can rearrange what it was that was going to be a conflict. I'll, I'll still make that time. And then, you know, Jamie, I've also heard about the chronic canceller. Yeah. The patient. And then you, you just basically put them on a schedule. Say, you know what? We're going to call you an hour since, since you, you seem to be really busy. We're going to, we're going to put you on a, a call list. And if we have an opening in an, in an hour, we'll call you. I mean, have you ever done that with your oh, chronic Absolutely. Cancer? Don't reward the patients that have, right. if they miss or change three appointments to keep one, do not pre-schedule them. You just tell them, we'll send you a, um, an email reminder that you're due Perfect. in the next month, or we'll send you a postcard, whatever it is you want to do, but do not reward them. Right. Amy, you have 10 minutes. Okay. So a balanced schedule is an open time of le less than 10%, but the appropriate amount of time that is allowed for appointments, um, it's hard to get everything done in less than 60 minutes. I'm just going to tell you that. And um, I know that some people have their back against the wall, and so they've gone to 50 minutes, but something will, something will be left. It'll be either poor documentation, it'll be diagnosis, it'll be patient care, it'll be patient education. And right. we, you know that you have a, if your hygiene schedule is full for the next four to six weeks with time set aside for priority care procedures, then you're doing okay. So here's just an example. If you have two full-time hygienists, this is how you're going to know how many blocks you need. Okay. And I have my email at the end of this. So if you guys have any problems, you can, you can reach out to me. I'm, I'll be happy to help you. So you have two full-time hygienists. You're going to figure out how many patients you need. They, they need 800 active patients, adult patients, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to keep their schedule full. So that's 1600 total. Then you need to find out how many actual patients they saw. And so in this example, they saw in the last 12 months, 1,300. So that you minus that 1,300 from what they need, and that gives you 300. You then take that 300 and you divide it by 1,600, and that gives you your, your, um, your supply and demand. So for this example, they are 19% below their supply and demand. So they, they have too many patient hours versus what they're really seeing. So engineer your schedule for growth. If we are keeping these patients in the schedule, like reappointing, like you mentioned before, Art, um, then we should be growing. If you're seeing 30 new patients a month and you're keeping 70, you know, 65% or higher of your active patients back into the schedule, we should be growing our hygiene hours all the time. But we see yeah. through dental intel that we're not. That's one. You of know, Jamie, things. one of my favorite one of my favorite metrics on dental intel is. Yep. How many of the new patients are getting reappointed after their first visit? And exactly. I see horrible, horrible numbers. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to just move on. This is one of the things that we have a hard time with, with time management, is that the doctor comes in to do the exam and the hygienist doesn't tee up, for lack of a better term, or bring a silver platter and hand it to the doctor the doctor sometimes is starting from scratch and there's no reason for that. It is not diagnosing if the doctor gloves up and, and, and agrees with you. That is, that's called co-diagnosing. So it's really important for our, because for the whole office, it makes them, the doctor run behind and getting back to the restorative chair. The other thing that keeps us 
um, from not staying on time is that we don't call for the doctor exam at the earliest part of the appointment. We a lot of times wait till we get ready to start polishing and then the doctor's right in the middle of a root canal or in the middle of some big procedure and they can't get over in five minutes when you're done with the polishing or three minutes. So if you will get all your gathering of your data, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. There's your health history update, your blood pressure screening, full mouth probe, enteral images, and your x-rays, and you know the chief complaint of the patient, and you know what kind of hygiene visit you're going to either recommend or do, you call for the doctor before you ever pick up a scaler. And that way now the doctor has a full 40 minutes to come to the chair. And then you tee it up. You're not diagnosing. It's called co-diagnosing. And you explain to the doctor in about one minute, two minutes, the things that you and Mrs. Jones talked about. And also, Jamie, they have this thing called a morning huddle, which I heard is a pretty good thing to have, right? Very good thing. That's that's important. That's your roadmap. That is that is the reason for that is to not talk about the date you went on the night before or or what you and your the movie you and your wife saw, you know. That is specifically for each team member to have be in charge and responsible for their own chair their own schedule and report only what is needed to the team um, and then also looking for schedule roadblocks so here are some of the pushback that we hear about right my patients only want what their insurance pays for i don't like to feel you know these are these are hygiene thoughts lots of times i don't like to feel like a salesman and i can't diagnose well one of the things we'd like to say is that if if you if my patients only want what their insurance pays for what I say to say to their, I'm not going to tell you what I really tell my clients to say because I'm, <laughs> I'm going to tell, I'm going to do a, a, a G version of it. Um, and that is that I understand that, you know, it sounds like there's some maybe concerns with finances and that's why you only want what your insurance pays. But doctor and I would never recommend treatment. We are your healthcare providers that you didn't need. Your insurance is an added benefit and they are a financial institution and they do not care about your health. We do. So we are not going to dictate what you need based on what your insurance will add benefits for. We're going to dictate what your health or your disease needs and that what's right for you. And you're not a salesman if you're educating them. And if you believe, if you believe in your services and that what you do in that chair is something that they could never do at home, if you know that, you don't feel like a salesman. You've got to be able to get across to them that you are a, a, a part of the healthcare team that they see, just like their medical doctors. You're not going to be replacing it. And Jamie, mm -hmm. this COVID-19 pandemic creates a whole nother opportunity yes. to say we have a higher standard of care that we have to fulfill. And if we don't, you know, whether you want to hear this or not, if we don't tell you about this, we need to tell you because if you can keep your mouth clean and your mouth healthy, that's going to give you a much better chance in fighting this horrible, horrible virus. Yeah, and I and I think we have to be a little careful. It's a very good value right. point there. We have to be a little careful, but we do have to let them know, remind them that the 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 high risk pathogens that cause the bleeding, and that's you just have to keep saying bleeding, you know. Um, the high risk bugs that are in your mouth right now that are causing this bleeding can help can lead to things like we have proof now that increased um, A1C level, high blood pressure medications don't work, certain cancers. And I'm not here to scare you, Art, about what, what these are, but even the COVID, because th that is a a lung issue. It also affects the liver. And these high risk pathogens are going right into your bloodstream and going everywhere around. And we just want to make sure that you understand that we take your health serious. And it's not just about saving teeth anymore. Right, right, right. A Amy, I want to go maybe close to 140. Can we do, I mean, uh, 40 I'm minutes after? I'm done with this. So give me what? one minute. One no, minute. I just want to make sure you have time for questions and yep. wrap the whole thing up. So. So in order for us as leaders of the team, the doctors on the team, we have to be able to give permission to our hygienists and even our assistants to think like a doctor. And we have to have um, give them the knowledge so that they can, so they're, can they're confident with it. So first permission, then we have to give them knowledge so they understand your philosophies. The hygienists also have to do the same thing with the rest of the team. And then accountability. So now you need to, if you go to the chair and you don't see diagnostic images and you don't see a full mouth perio chart with bleeding and recession, 
on there or you don't see them recommending periotherapy when you can clearly see they have active infection, that's when you have to have that conversation with your hygienist and hold them accountable. Because, you know, just like x-rays, if I can't see all levels of bone, if I were a doctor, I'd say, you know what, I, I see that you took these imaging, images. Can you just, Jamie, can you please just um, take one or two more on each side? And they'll know exactly what it is. And I'll go finish that root canal and I'll be back. All it takes are one or two times for you to interrupt their, their time management. And they will make sure that they redo that before you ever come to the chair for the exam. So I said I'd give an offering to this. And what I would like to do is offer a 30-minute complimentary ROH, return on hygiene discussion, with a small, a mini hygiene analysis. We do hygiene analysis where it's a detailed one. It's a five-page report. But if you um, will just go and send um, a meeting request with me to clients at inspiredhygiene.com. And in the subject line, if you would put, and I hope I'm going to pronounce this right, but is it Edie Bailey? I, I, I Bailey. I, dang it. I, I've been here five days. I got it down. Yay! It's I Bailey. <laughs> I don't feel so bad, but I.D. Bailey. Um, I, then, I Bailey, yeah. I Bailey, no E. Like the Ides of March. Got it. I Bailey. Got it, Bailey. Okay, we'll move on. But anyways, I would do a complimentary 30-minute call with you. You would send in some numbers, and I would do a little small analysis, and I would give you some of this data that we just talked about. Um, on here to see where you're at. If you don't want, if you don't know to how to grab the number, we tell you what reports to to use and and all of that. So questions and answers. I see. Yeah, that one. I saw one. I saw one. Uh, let's see. Let me read this. It's, uh, it's De Debbie. Uh, we have several sent emails, texts to reactivate patients, and have made numerous calls using uh, DI, but our numbers are still down for October, November, especially. What other recommendations do you have? to increase schedule hygiene. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so I would go back to Debbie. Um, I would go back to what I was saying. I would run a report. I don't know what software, if you type in there, what software you run, but I would find your, first of all, the patients that come in, they're live right there. Don't automatically schedule them for six months. The patients that you're seeing right now, I would offer them to be seen in the fall. And, and here's why. Um, as far as pulling up your patients who have certain insurances, find your top five insurance companies that you utilize and that allow two per calendar year. And I would be reaching out to them first. The other thing is if you have, and I know you've been working with Kim, Debbie's office has been working with Kim Miller, who's one of our other lead productivity coaches. Um, I, I would get that report, but if you guys are getting your periotherapy um, numbers up, then your perio maintenance patients, I would be getting them in. Now, perio maintenance has to be 90 days in a day. So you can't do those any sooner, but I would schedule them for two. I would get them, if I did perio therapy today, I'd be scheduling them for their um, August, September, October, and November, December, January. I'd get them both in the books. Jamie, do you have, do you have a, a slide that's got your contact information that we can put up while we're answering these questions? Yes. Um, can Could I put you, it in the, the chat? Yeah, just go ahead and put it in the chat. So everybody, and again, if, if you need uh, to get a hold, you can go to you know S Haberman at idbelly.com or a Wiederman at idbelly.com and we'll get you contacted here. So there, um, there's my email. It's Jamie J A M I E, the old fashioned way, the boy name spelling <laughs> at inspiredhygiene.com. Okay. Sounds good. We really appreciate it. So um, any final thoughts, uh, Jamie, that you might have? Uh, uh, I mean, I, I think the key is that the doctor has to set the tone for the office as to what his or her philosophy is on hygiene. And if they don't make it a priority, then it's not going to be a priority. Yeah, it, it has to be. And when you, when you step into the role of a true healthcare provider and not a mouth maid, it's amazing how the burnout changes it is because you're, you're doing more. I was just on a call yesterday with some clients in Tennessee that are thinking about coming on board and, and, and hiring me as their coach. And they, they want to introduce all these next level services. They want to get their hygienists laser certified. They're at 18% perio, which is oh, wow. good compared to a lot of them, but no, that honestly art, we get below 10 on average. I, on average. I, I I gave a talk to Henry Schein's national sales team at their office in Milwaukee, their national office, and their national sales manager told me a couple of years ago, 
he believes the, the national average for you know percentage of hygiene production of 4,000 codes is about 9%. Does that yeah. seem reasonable to you? Yeah, it, it's absolutely the truth. Um, you know, and that's why we have this job. We're all passionate. We're all, I, I was in the trenches for almost 35 years. I've been in the dental field for 40. I always joke and say I came out of the womb with a scaler in my hand. Right, <laughs> or I, I must have started when I was 10 because there's just. I'd no like to meet your mom, Jamie. That's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah, God, that's it. My AD, the ADA is looking at this going, are you crazy here? <laughs> But I mean, I just can't believe I've been in the dental field since 1980 because I, you know, it just doesn't see it. And, and I, I, I love it. But, but I would just say, doctors, the best you can and hold your, your hygienist accountable. Once you've come up, if you don't have a standard of care document that you've all filled out about how often you're taking blood pressures, updating health history, when you see four millimeter pockets with bleeding, we're going to treat. Are we going to treat active gingivitis with the gingival therapy code of 4346? Get those things in writing, have everybody agree to it and sign it and date it. And that's also a form for you to go back to so that if they aren't following what they've all agreed to, you can have that discussion with them. Megan, you have proof. I, I know that ADA obviously has a lot to say about hygiene but I'm assuming that a lot of this stuff is spot on and uh, that they're encouraging their doctors to really be proactive and hygiene and stuff like that. Do they, do they, do they do stuff? Do they have resources on the website for hygiene and stuff like that? They do. Yeah, we do on our practice management pages. We, we have a lot of information and um, we also just updated our back to work protocols with um, checklists for also patients. So making sure that you're making the dental office as attractive to patients as possible. But yeah, that's all on our practice management pages. And then there's a number of things that are also crossed over with science where we talk about um, the need for hygiene in terms of overall health and the health of the dental practice and things like that. Yeah. Is there anything else, any questions or anything other thoughts, Megan, that you would like to add to um, my presentation? You're, you're welcome to add anything you want. I mean, for us right now, and Art's talked about this before, um, in some ways this crisis is, can be beneficial to practices that really need to reevaluate the kind of practice model that they had before. And I think Art has been great in saying, you know, maybe we take this as an opportunity to do some kind of internal searching about how to be better patrons to our patients, make sure our team is on board and make sure everyone's kind of on the same page and really feels dedicated to the practice and taken care of by the practice, both the patient and, and the employees. So Art's been really good at being like, you know, maybe we just take this moment as a pause and an internal um, exploration about where you want your business to go next. Um, yeah. so that's something that we really like to hear positivity wise from the ADA. And because the profession is doing relatively well in comparison with other ones right now, you know, it really, it's not a bad time to reevaluate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a bad time. I would say it is a, a needed time. Beyond, it's never been needed more. Yeah. Yeah, doctors, it, it is, it, you need to be working not just in your business, but on your business. There's never been a better time to hire a dental coach. I don't have to market uh, Inspired Hygiene. They're as good as it gets. They have been for, for years and years and years. But this is the time for you to work on your business, take a step back, think about what it is that you do, what your legacy is. Again, I, I, I have this conversation with doctors when I when I, when, I, when I finish in a practice transition, I say, you know, your career is not about fixing teeth. You're about a better life, a better job, a better relationship, a better self-esteem, and, and better total health for you and your family. And, and you know, people like Jamie and Rachel and, and, and Inspired Hygiene and the, the folks at ADA and, and, and us at iBailey, we're, we're all here to help you and, and, and try and get you there. But, you know, it, 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 it's kind of like we, when we talk about coaching patients, we say, the patient's ready when the patient's ready. And doctor, you're going to be ready when you wake up one day and say, you know, something is not right in my practice and I need to do something about it. Yeah. And that, when you're ready to do that, there are resources, right? Yeah, so. that, that's probably one of the things that we get, um, especially from doctors that are purchasing a practice that is from a, a bread and butter so for lack of a better term, doctor, is that they know something's not right. And they, they're just like, this is, this is not what the kind of practice I want. And so we get hired a lot by the new business owner. Yeah. And, and that's a, that's a great up because there's, there's only opportunity there. So, all right, uh, Scott, you still there? Anything, any comments you have about any of this stuff? Are you still there? 
I think we lost Scott. Came maybe. back about uh, 20 minutes ago uh, by miracle. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're here. Can you hear so me? It, yeah, they, they have Wi-Fi in Colorado? Yeah, good. <laughs> I'm using my phone as a hotspot. I somehow oh got back on. All right, well, that's, that's good. But, you know, guys, if you have any questions about any of these numbers or stuff, give Scott a call, give me a call, Pam, Don, Sam, we can all help you with this. Uh, Megan, thank you so much again for everything you and Michael and especially with this HHS. I know that your uh, government affairs, uh, one of your government affairs people were helping with this HHS thing. And I saw the emails from him. Uh, was it Ken, Ken was David, it? David Lynn. I have to give David a shout out for being amazing on the Provider Relief Fund and really working so closely with HHS round the clock to get this clarification. That, that's great. Well, guys, I want to thank you. I think we're at the end of our time today. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, thank you for some fantastic, fantastic information. Thank please you take for her, having please me. Take, yeah, please take her up on the, on the offer. Megan, thank you again. Um, Scott, as always, it's great. I'm really excited to be part of the iBailey team. And um, hopefully, um, you know, uh, if you like dumb jokes, you'll like having me around and stuff. But uh, there you go. And uh, for all of you, thank you for listening. Tell your friends about our webinar. It's going to be, Amy, it's going to be available on our website probably, what, Monday, Tuesday? Yeah, it'll be available on Monday, and we'll also send out the link. Great. Well, folks, and again, I'll give you my, my five words. We're four months into this pandemic. Failure is not an option. Uh, th th these are resources like you know Jamie and the other folks we brought to you uh, that can help you get your practice back to as quickly as we can to where it was. And uh, God bless all of you. And thank you for listening today and uh, have a wonderful weekend and um, stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye guys.